Welcome to the Good Life EDU podcast presented by the Nebraska ESU Coordinating Council. I'm your host, Andrew Easton. Thanks for joining us as we discuss the latest in digital learning across Nebraska and around the country. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back for another episode of the Good Life EDU podcast. And today I'm getting a chance to chat with Katie Novak, graduate instructor, writer, and consultant uh, about UDL. And so this is a, a topic that I know here in our state, we recently had a chance to share some PD for me work out about this. ESU 10 is invested in learning more about UDL, uh, actually with Katie's consulting firm coming up here uh, in the not too distant future. So we wanted to get the word out about UDL and knew that there was no one better to ask than Katie. So Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to share what I know about this incredible framework and how it really helps to empower and celebrate both teachers and learners. Who wouldn't love a conversation about that, right? (laughs) I'm also really geeked uh, for us to chat today. So thank you for your time. And for those that don't know you, can you give us a little bit of backstory for you in education? Sure. So I was a secondary English teacher. I taught high school English and middle school English in what was a very traditional model where there were different levels of students and I provided them with different educational experiences. And about 15 years ago, I was working for a district that was really looking to scale inclusive practices and they were looking for teachers to pilot truly inclusionary placements. So moving away from a behavior program and a substantially separate life skills program and a therapeutic learning program and saying that we can really meet the needs of all of these students, regardless of their variability and identity in a co-taught classroom. And so I was a part of the first cohort who was opting into that experience. And as a result, I got a ton of professional learning in universal design. And it absolutely like blew my mind of what is possible within a classroom. And in that role, because I was an early adopter, I then became a part of the team who was scaling it throughout the district. So I started off being a practitioner, sharing with my colleagues what was happening in my classroom with my learners. And then I went into administration. I've been a reading coordinator for a district, an ELL director, and an assistant superintendent of schools. Um, That's what I did for the previous six years before I transitioned into consulting and teaching graduate courses full time. So for me, I learned about UDL as a teacher, my heart belongs to teachers. And as I transitioned into administration, my focus was not only sharing the power of this framework, but modeling the power of this framework by providing professional development experiences that better met the needs of like an incredibly diverse teaching force. And that is the work that I love and I get to do today. And I'm really excited to learn more about this too. Uh, And I also really appreciate, I know Simon Sinek, uh, there's a quote that I love from him that says that the best ideas are the honest ones, uh, the ones that are born out of personal experience that are designed to help a few and end up helping many. And I can tell that that uh, really is where this work started for you, right? It sounds like from a classroom practitioner's lens all the way through to your current roles that you're able to have impact in education. So for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about here, universal Mm -hmm. design, universal design for learning. Yeah. What, uh, what is this, Katie? Well, let's go back and talk about universal design for architecture because the phrase is, you can call it barred or stolen from architecture, but Ron Mace was a very well-known architect who was instrumental in making federal buildings accessible for anyone to get into them. So if we go back decades and you have a federal building, there would be stairs to get up into it and there was no elevators and they were just not accessible. And Ron Mace was basically like, why are we spending so much time retrofitting buildings when we're building these buildings, you know, people are going to come in with limited mobility. Like, why are we spending so much time reacting to really predictable differences among humans? So this concept of universal design and architecture is really thinking about the variability of anyone who you could potentially serve and how do you build a building that anyone can get into. So the concept of universal design for learning is how can you build a classroom that any student could be placed into, regardless of their need for academic advancement or enrichment, or their need for really significant support. And this can be academic or behavioral or social emotional. And just as putting stairs on a building excluded many people from being to enter that building, 
many teaching practices and curriculum adoptions actually prevent many students from being placed in an inclusive classroom with their peers, and that is rightfully theirs. And so how do we create different entryways and access points within a single classroom so that we can provide acceleration and support, but also what's more important is really allowing the learner to make decisions for themselves about what they need. And for too long in education, we have compartmentalized students and put them in like different labels. Like these are struggling learners and these are strong readers and these are the students who need acceleration. And let's just separate them and give them what they need as if they are static. And what we know is we're so different all the time that we really need to consent to the support and the acceleration in the given day. So what Universal Design for Learning offers is flexible pathways, but really encourages something we call expert learning, which is for a learner to think about what do I need right now to be successful? So an example that I use all the time is like, you could say that I'm a very strong reader and that my ability to decode grade level text, like a college text and comprehend that would be pretty strong, I think, for an adult. If the text is in English, if I am wearing corrective lenses, if I am not super distracted. And so if I was in a class and you put me in the strong reader group, I would probably never have the option to listen to an audiobook because you've already assumed I'm a strong reader. I don't need that. But what about the day where I have like a crazy migraine or one of my contact lenses fell out? And so I just pulled out the other one and now I literally can't see the page. In those instances, what is necessary for some should be available to me. And that's what universal design really is, is thinking about what is the support? What is the level of challenge? that somebody may need and how do we offer those options to everyone? So it's this added component of how do we allow students to become more self-directed, more self-reflective and to take more agency in their own learning. And I love all the things that you're advocating for there. And as I start to think about that from a classroom practitioner's lens as well, I wonder what is the process for onboarding students to that type of experience, right? And so, I mean, I think that on some level, you have to either self-identify your strengths, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, or it would make sense too that there would be an experience potentially that would help me better understand that about myself. Is that kind of accurate with the work? Yes, exactly. So a really great generic example is when I'm providing a mini lesson, I'm framing a lesson, maybe I'm gonna provide 10 or 15 minutes of instruction. I want learners to have the best possible chance of like remembering (laughs) what I had shared. So I might do an audio or a video recording of my presentation so they can go back and access it. But then I also might provide options for them to take notes. So I might start off by saying, listen, there are numerous evidence-based ways to take notes. And I want you to try all of them first. I always called it a no thank you bite (laughs) to say, why don't we try all of these things? And then you can reflect on whether or not that is beneficial for your learning. So I will provide you with some instruction on how to take Cornell notes. I will give you some graphic organizers that might be helpful. We'll share some examples, but I'm gonna provide instruction every day for 10 or 15 minutes. And at the end of the week, when we take an assessment, you can use your Cornell notes. But what I really want to ask you is, are those notes beneficial for your learning? Because some students are incredibly distracted by note taking, where others get really distracted if they're not taking notes. But that's really going to depend on a lot of different factors. So once they all know how to use a Cornell note, then it would be like, okay, so I want you to think back to this experience because next week we're going to do sketch noting. And then I'm going to ask you, which of these is better for your learning? Or do you think it's going to be some sort of like mashup of the two? And so I think that some people rush to saying to a bunch of learners, you can take notes this way, this way, or this way. And the students like don't know about any of those three ways. So I think the key is to minimize the threat of taking risks and trying all these things by ensuring that you don't have any negative impact on student grades for things that they try. 
So if you were to take an assessment and just absolutely blow it because you were so distracted by the Cornell notes, that's no worries at all. Like anyone can revise anything. So just know that this is not going to prevent you from learning, but this micro failure is like an awesome step forward. So you know what would be helpful for you. And I think what's so fascinating is people will push back and say, you know, in college, they're not going to give you all these options in work. They're not going to give you all these options. And it's like, no, they're going to say, remember what I say. And and that's it. Like there won't be any instructions to do the Cornell notes or to do the sketch notes is they are simply going to assume that you are able to do what you need to do to remember what happened in the classroom. So how can we provide all of these experiences for students to get to know what they need and how those needs actually change quite a bit based on context. And it would strike me that some of this work would be uh, something that could be integrated. I know like here in Nebraska, we have our MTSS system where uh, there's different supports like these that we're looking to provide learners, uh, I think particularly in that tier one support. And so uh, I know that that work can look differently in different parts of the country and that kind of thing. But generally speaking, how do you see UDL working hand in hand with it, something like MTSS? So for me, MTSS is about supplementing services. So I cannot say this enough, is when we're talking about tier one, tier two, tier three, it's like a snowman. You have your tier one base and everybody gets that, but there are going to be some learners who need additional support. It's not that they need instead of support. And one of the things that I say all of the time is like, you cannot intervention your way out of a weak tier one foundation. And there are far too many learners who are called tier two students. And I'm using quote fingers here. Um, Tier two is not a placement. It's not an adjective to describe a student. It's additional services that students may need based on evidence. And so you're going to end up over identifying students who need intervention because tier one is actually preventing a lot of learning. So I love to talk about food for MTSS because if my goal of my multi-tiered dinner system is that everyone has like some delicious and nutritious dinner and I serve a tuna noodle casserole in tier one, I'm excluding anyone who's vegan, anyone who's vegetarian, anyone who's lactose intolerant, anyone who's gluten sensitive, anyone who thinks tuna noodle casserole is gross, right? All of those people are going to be really hungry. And then I'm like, oh, great. Now we have all these people who need tier two. They don't need tier two. They just need me to do a better job designing a buffet of options while thinking about that firm goal. And so I think that when we talk about a multi-tiered system, the entire system is really dependent on everyone having equitable access to a tier one general education classroom with their peers. That is the North Star of a multi-tiered system. And if equity and inclusionary placements and universal design are not driving that, all you're going to end up with is continued segregation of students, where data is used not to determine who needs additional services, but is used as an argument as to why students don't belong. And we have to move away from our segregated placements instead of, you know, instead of saying like the kid needs to go somewhere else, we need to say my practices need to change. But that requires a lot of support from the system through professional development, through high quality, flexible curriculum and technology, and through really strong leadership. So for me, I always like to shift the goal of a multi-tiered system is to ensure that all students get what they need when they need it, in addition to being included in a classroom with peers. And that can only happen if we recognize what are the barriers that are preventing that placement and how do we eliminate them through design? Because our general education classrooms are not designed for all kids. They're designed for students who speak English, who have the behavioral expectations of dominant culture, that do not have disabilities. We know who does well in our school systems, and it's not everyone. And instead of saying we need another place, is we need to change our practices. And that requires us to design our classrooms differently. Well, and it would strike me then, too, that the the buy-in piece would be a little bit of a challenge because, right, teachers tend to say, well... Katie, I I make a mean tuna noodle casserole and I know that I can go to tuna noodle casserole and get 
70% of my learners to sit at the table and eat. Uh, and so how do we help them to cook other meals, I guess, to play this metaphor out? Or like, how do we start to help them think differently about their approach to dinner? So I think that one of the most important things that we can do is allow them to experience the flexibility. So when people say, you know, how do we get teachers to buy in? I'm like, allow teachers to experience really flexible professional learning opportunities. Because if you're going to say, it is really important that you give your students autonomy and you allow them to choose how they're going to learn and how they're going to share what they know. But all of you are going to read this article in hard copy and then all of you are going to join a breakout room and all of you are going to answer these questions. It's like, that's ironic because that is literally serving tuna noodle casserole. So I think that there is an incredible opportunity to design professional learning in ways that model what we want to see in our classrooms. You know, if the firm goal is to learn about universal design for learning, to build a background, would you prefer to read an article digitally or in hard copy or listen to this podcast or watch this short video? And then when you come back, would you prefer to work in a small group or just work individually to answer this prompt? And you can answer it in writing or you can answer it in a discussion. Now let's take a quick check in and see how is this going for you? What's working really well? What do you wish we had for support so I can plan the next session to better meet your needs? So when we provide really flexible professional support and we have data that teachers are recognizing, like I'm feeling like I am getting what I'm needing, I'm feeling seen, then we can begin to say, now which of these practices could you potentially begin to integrate in your classroom? So it's not about changing everything all at once is, Maybe my first step with a tuna noodle is simply not to put the casserole together, to keep the pasta on the side, to keep the cream sauce on the side, to put the tuna on the side, and then I add marinara. Just with that really small deconstruction, you're going to have more people who can eat. And so I think that we can't expect teachers to change if we don't have a demonstration of impact that incentivizes that change, because we're asking teachers to do a lot. And honest to goodness, like people are doing the best they can with what they have. And when we continue to talk to people about the necessity for flexibility without offering that flexibility, it's really difficult to get people who want to try these things with their own environment. And so I'm sure there are those out there that are listening in and hearing us talk about kind of compartmentalizing different portions of this experience with different options at those different points in time. Uh, I know that UDL is different from differentiation, but, mm -hmm. but I would not be surprised if someone listening in might have interpreted what you just said as being a version of that. So can you kind of parcel out the difference between the two? Yes, please. So the biggest difference is who is differentiating. So universal design for learning should be the design of like that first best instruction. So I was an English teacher. So let's say that my goal was that students will write a narrative with really great descriptive detail. That is the firm goal. The firm goal requires writing. So I can say to students, okay, listen, you can handwrite your first draft, you can use keyboarding, you can use voice to text, but ultimately you need to craft a narrative. So to give you the best experience of crafting a really great narrative, I'm gonna have like three really great examples of authors who just have beautiful narrative technique. And you're gonna choose at least one of them and you're gonna read or listen to the text. And then you're gonna answer questions about like what descriptive details really popped out and you can either write that down or have a conversation. And then you ultimately can decide how do you want to write a narrative, right? So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put an image up. I want you to describe what you see in that image. And then I am going to look at your first drafts. And then I'm gonna put you in small instructional groups based on what I think would be a great revision strategy for you. So every student in that classroom, has all of those options and choices. So they can choose which text they wanna read or listen to. They can choose if they want a keyboard or handwrite. Maybe there's an option to use a graphic organizer or sentence stems, but ultimately I end up with the student work. And I can always put student work in three piles. Kids who nailed it based on the standard, kids who got it, and then kids who just haven't gotten it yet. Even given the support, the writing is not there. There is not strong narrative technique. 
So what I would do then is I would essentially have three different little mini lessons and I would pull the group of students to say, I need to differentiate support for these students here because there is no narrative technique. So then I might say, okay, let's talk about imagery. Let's talk about the five senses. I don't wanna do that to my whole class because I have some kids who nailed that writing and they're like, Novak is losing it. If she's <laughs> asking me to like tell what color is in that picture. So differentiated instruction is how we respond to student evidence. So in every classroom in a multi-tiered system, we start with universal design. We provide options and choices to our learners. And then when we have evidence or data, if you wanna use that word, which is kind of a bad word sometimes, then we think about what specific experiences do these students need based on this actual goal. So I'm not saying I'm gonna pull my students with disabilities. I'm not saying I'm gonna pull my English learners. What I'm saying is, these six kids do not have an understanding of any of the narrative technique yet, and they need more time with me. So I'm going to pull that group. And while I pull that group, maybe everyone else gets to choose another narrative to read or listen to, and then they're going to compare and contrast what they wrote to the other one, right? So it takes a lot of like really planful considerations of like, what are the scaffolds that we need? What are the levels of challenge that we need? But ultimately, we need to be responsive to student work. And so that's why there's such a huge culture of evidence-driven decision-making in a multi-tiered system, because it's not enough just to be like, here are your options, good luck, without saying, now let's really look at what did you choose and how did it lead to your current level of performance and what could you have done differently? Because my responsibility is to help you be more self-directed in your learning, but also I am a safety net of you clearly didn't learn this yet and you need more time with me. Well, and as a former English teacher myself, uh, I'm loving all of this, right? Like I, this makes sense to me in the different texts and as far as writing support goes. If I were to be, let's say a math teacher though, where I see my work as being a little bit more, uh, two plus two is four. Yep. <laughs> and maybe I'm expected to cover a very concrete, like this is the content for today. So what does it look like maybe in a discipline that would be traditionally a little less flexible with some of these options? Well, I mean, it could even be like, let's say that you have like three really robust word problems for learners to work on. And you're going to work on these today and you have the option to use this done problem, you know, that can help you. You can use a calculator or not use a calculator. You can use open book or open notes. You know, at the end, you have these three word problems that students got correct or didn't get correct. So the next day, the students who got them all correct would do something differently than the students who did not. So I might say something like anyone who got number one wrong is going to be with me for 10 minutes and let's go through this problem. I don't want to do that for the kids who got it correct. And so it's even just looking at like what are kind of the lagging skills you know, who needs more instruction in this area here? And that could be based on a lot of things. You could do it based on student self-assessment. You could do it based on actual like quizzes. Like if you scored in this range, this is what you need to work on. If you scored in this range, I want you to try a much more difficult problem, you know, to see how that goes for you. But the interesting thing is during the reset, the same options and choices are provided to everyone. So you don't want to stay in differentiated instruction and like create within class ability groups because mm -hmm. you're going to lose all the power of inclusionary practices. So it's really every lesson starts with universal design. Every student has opportunities to make choices about their learning. Some will be really effective. Some will not be super responsible yet. And then when we have evidence that some students are not making growth, we have to provide them with a little bit of a different experience than the students who are because otherwise you end up giving a whole class lecture that is just going to not be in the zone of proximal development of very many people. So, you know, whole class instruction in a university design classroom should be very, very limited to like an early mini lesson to frame, like, this is what we're doing today, maybe unpacking some vocabulary, modeling some math problems, doing a science demo. And then once you have the evidence on a formative assessment, that's when you do your flexible grouping and regrouping. And I've seen that work in, in any classroom. It could be in physical education, it could be in music, it could be in mathematics, but it really is about ensuring that your formative assessments align really explicitly 
to your standards, your firm goals, so you can better create those small groups for differentiated instruction. Well, thanks for answering that, because I, I do think that's definitely a, a talking point worth exploring for our teachers who maybe think that there isn't space for some of these things. But I love that. Start with your UDL model as you begin to design. From and a lot then- of teachers actually do that with an extra help already. Like you'll recommend certain kids for extra help. How do you provide small group extra help in your class, right? That's really like the model of differentiated instruction. And if you feel like you can't do that because you're always up in front of the classroom, that's where like UDL can actually free you up because when there's options and choices for students to work more independently, you can provide that extra help, that extra challenge. And I haven't worked with very many teachers who didn't want to do that. It was like, where do I find the time to do that was, is much more problematic. Well, and that's actually was going to be my next question was what are some of those initial getting started challenges that you find teachers have to kind of work through? So you mentioned one of them there potentially would just be the time. Yeah, I've worked with a number of teachers who will say, if I don't direct the learning, students aren't going to do anything. And that is an incredibly deficit-based model that we have to challenge. So students are capable of learning independently. They're capable of self-directed learning. It's often that they truly have never really given an opportunity to figure out what works best for them or to experience the very natural consequences of doing something that doesn't really work that well. And so we might have to start off in really small areas, but you know, I was working with some high school teachers recently. They're like, I can't do small groups. The kids won't do anything. I'm like, okay, so like, what are the barriers then that are preventing students from doing something? And is your model truly that effective? Like if every kid that you have in your class is truly making incredible progress and it's inclusive, then that's lovely. We don't have classrooms like that. We have honors classrooms that students do really well, but that's such an exclusionary placement because there's so many things you have to do to get in. So it's basically like many honors classes are kind of like if you were a pediatrician and you only did well visits. Like, oh my gosh, my my patients are so healthy. It's like, well, because you don't take sick patients. And so when you have students who have struggled academically, In a class, if you are doing something and every student is wildly successful, please share your practices with others. But what often happens is when we give the same thing to kids, some kids are really going to struggle. And this mentality of I need to have the whole class doing something with me or they won't be successful just is not supported by the evidence base or research or dare I say even just like common understanding of variability. So as we move to more and more inclusive placements and we have kids who really need some challenge and kids who really need some support. And the kids actually shuffle based on the day because of if they're tired or hungry or if they're experiencing trauma, we need them to be more self-directed. And so what I would say is if you're struggling because you don't feel like students are capable, you have to start somewhere because we get good at things by practicing. And if you never have the opportunity to practice making your own choices, then the likelihood of being able to make them is not going to be super high. I would also say accountability measures are huge. So if I'm going to say to a student, you can read this text or listen to this text. And then here's the question. And you're going to answer this question either in writing or in audio. And then I pull every student who did not get that correct. That is not a punishment. It's okay. So tell me, did you read or listen to it? Talk about your annotation strategy. Did you take any notes? Now talk to me about like what was challenging. Maybe next time try this is, you know, I have done this in classrooms of 35 students and does every student make a responsible choice every day? Absolutely not. Do we as adults make responsible choices every day? Absolutely not. So it's all about like, let's talk about what is the best way to set yourself up at success and let's try for that to be responsible a few more times than not responsible. Like I'll take the scale in the right direction, but I never, never once had a student who was not able to make responsible choices some of the time if given enough time and support. And I think that we just have to value becoming a learner as much as we value some of our academic standards. And so I'd imagine there's a certain degree of teacher clarity and a leadership piece that has to be in place because otherwise it does, I'm sure, become which comes first, the chicken or the egg scenario where they're 
students don't have the agency to be able to <laughs> step into these spaces when given the chance. However, if we don't give them the chance, will they ever be able to develop that? And also, like we know, I've, I've heard so many times lately, like Maslow Trump's bloom, that like your basic safety and belonging needs need to be met before your your cognitive load is really open for like academic learning. And so that's also like we have to create communities. We have to create classrooms where students truly feel like they belong so that they are open to making choices. One of the things that I always say is just because there are choices does not in any way, shape or form mean your class is universally designed. It's have you eliminated the barrier that would have prevented success. So if I only serve you tuna noodle and you are vegan, you simply can't access that meal. So if I say, oh, don't worry, you can have tuna noodle or steak. I have done nothing to support you in any way, right? And it's like, but I'm already doing this. I've already made two meals. So like there's this component of really getting to know your kids and then having them help you to make really good decisions. So one awesome example, when my, I have four kids and when my son was in kindergarten, they do a lot of math fluency, right? A lot of like counting, adding and subtracting in 10, like that is the standard. And so the teacher would say, all right, everyone, today we're going to do 10 minutes to practice our math facts. One option is you can go into IXL math, which is just an adaptive math solution on your iPad, and you can practice for 10 minutes. Now, clearly you have to teach every student how to log into IXL and use it before you can do that. But one option is IXL. The other option is you can do like a make 10 game with a partner. So it's like a little deck of cards. If you throw a six, I go, wait, four. I need to put on a four to make 10, right? And so the teacher taught them how to do both of those things. And so it was like, we're all going to do IXL. We're all good with IXL. Now we're all going to do the make 10 game. Now you have a choice, the make 10 game or the IXL. And one day when they were teaching remote, she said to them, I want to add a third option today, but I really don't know what to do. Now these are kindergartners. Does anyone have anything they do at home where they practice counting? And this little love was like, oh, I love to make my own tests. I said, oh, tell me about that. He's like, you know, like one plus one, like basically he's making himself a little worksheet and then he fills it out. And she's like, I love that for idea three. Can you show us how you do it? Right. So it's this like co-creation because if I say, listen, I'm going to do like a pasta bar. And I was thinking about marinara and Alfredo, but like, is there anybody who needs something else? And someone's like, Oh, I could bring like a ratatouille or something. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, let's do this together. So there's a lot of looking at like, we want to provide choice, but we're really providing choices because we would exclude people if we didn't. And that requires that we elevate the voices of learners to try to figure out if none of these pathways meet your needs, why not? Like, what else do you need? And sometimes that means talking to parents. It often means, you know, really thinking about that with our colleagues. But like one size fits all does not work in an inclusionary classroom. Inclusionary classrooms are the foundation of multi-tiered systems. And so we really have to help teachers feel more prepared to provide appropriate options and choices and also be prepared for letting go of making decisions for kids, knowing that the early decisions they make are not going to be the most responsible because they just simply don't know what they need yet. Well, and I'm sure in the midst of that, and it's probably not, you could certainly do the things that you're talking about without technology, but I would imagine that as technology continues to evolve and more options become available uh, for some of these different choices that you're mentioning, uh, that has to really open things up, right? Oh my gosh, so much, so much. So I always say like, in most classes, we will have students read text, even if it's just directions, Right. So like math is very language based now, but even in an art class, we might say like, here are the directions for this art project that's coming up. Like, this is what you need to do. And so when we have text, we know there are some students in an inclusive class who cannot decode grade level text in English. They're either not English speakers yet. They just are significantly below grade level with decoding. You know, we know that there are only about 35% of students in the country who are reading at grade level. So we can all predict in an inclusive class, there are going to be some students who really struggle with decoding that text. So no tech option. I say, here's the directions. 
You can either read it on your own and get started, or you can come over here with me and I will read it out loud. That requires no tech, just my voice. We can go medium tech, which is I have the directions digitally. You can use Google read and write to read it out to you kind of bionically, right? It's not superhuman voice, but we also have these like amazing solutions where it's like a learning ally, which has like everything professionally read. So you can see that the teacher can say you have the option to read or listen, but that requires work from me. If I have it digitally, I'm like, okay, take out your iPads, have it read aloud if you need it. That requires less work for me. So, you know, I think that technology allows us to do what we do best, which is like really build relationships with students, help them reflect on their decisions, you know, help them to, to really think about, are you in a place today where you can challenge yourself? If so, how are you going to do that? Or are you like having your worst day today, which is okay. We all have our worst day. What support do you need? And that's the really important piece of that expert learning paradigm, which is that I don't want to make decisions for every kid every day because what they need changes. And asking me to do that for a hundred kids a day is simply not possible. But if I can get them to begin to do some of that reflection on their own, over time, classroom management will become much easier. Engagement increases. And in my own experience, I can tell you student growth increases astronomically. And I would imagine that those things all contribute to a really positive class culture when the learner feels recognized and feels like their teacher is willing to listen to them enough to pivot to things that can set them up for success. Absolutely. And again, all of it is true in professional learning as well, is that we're offering teachers options and choices to learn about UDL. But then, you know, we might say, write a reflection or record a short reflection on your learning. And then we provide different experiences based on that. You know, like for the third of you who wanted to know more about variability, I want to share something with you, you know, and that's what we do in our graduate courses is like we use data to provide different experiences to people. You know, I might write an email and say, hey, I'm writing you this email because all five of you are music educators. Like that's very differentiated instruction. If I'm doing something specifically for music educators, it's going to be differentiated instruction, but that group will still have access to everything everybody else has. You know, it's just like, you know, as I reflected, I saw that a lot of you were struggling with what does this look like in music class? So I have created and curated content specifically for your small group. So check these resources out and then connect in this discussion board. Well, I could sit and listen to you share about this all day. I love like thinking about things flexibly in this way and supporting students uh, with all the different avenues that you're uh, advocating for. But as it is always the case, 30 minutes goes really fast. So uh, Katie, I want to ask very briefly here as we bring things to a close, uh, what have I not asked that we should talk about before we sign off? I think that that is the meat is like, if you were going to take away anything from this presentation, it's that one size fits all doesn't work. And it, it's not just that it doesn't work based on preference. It doesn't work based on the fact that some people simply can't access it. And so if we want to design for everyone, we have to think about what are some of the barriers with one size fits all. But that does not mean that we won't target support based on who is making really significant progress and who isn't. So some people get really scared that UDL is like a free for all and everybody's just making choices that they wanna make and we lose academic rigor, it's not that at all. It's like, I want everyone to have access to this text. I want everyone to be able to produce work about what they've learned. And then that will allow me to adapt instruction and feedback based on what people need. And so I think that it is a both and is that we're gonna design so everyone has opportunities to make choices. And then we're also going to be really responsive to the needs of our learners to provide them with like really targeted feedback. And that often makes people feel better about the options and choices, because it's like, I don't want to give these choice boards and have all these kids like doing things that aren't going to result in learning. They won't get that far. It's like, I'm checking in with kids every day on formative assessments and pulling small groups. Well, thanks for sharing that and for advocating for all this. Where can people follow you or find you or continue to learn from you moving forward? I am everywhere. So <laughs> I'm on Twitter. My website is novaceducation.com, N-O-V-A-K education.com. And there's some cool blogs there. And we have like a free UDL mini course that you can take. And I've also collaborated with some amazing people. I've, I've written 10 books 
but we have uh, book club guides for all of them on the website as well. So if you ever wanted to do like a book study, there are book study guides that talk about potential ways to universally design a book study where there's like additional options and choices and multimedia and things like that. So feel free to check it out and reach out to me anytime. Terrific. Well, Katie, thank you so much for your time today, for all your advocacy, and really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you. My pleasure.